So Brian Zahn has become uh, one of my favorite authors. I read his stuff and I resonate with it. And it's weird because he wrote this book, Beauty Will Save the World, and I was writing a book that had beauty and his book was so influential, I quoted about a dozen times. And then he writes this, this newest book, Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God, which attacks sort of the, the angry God substitutionary atonement thing. And I'm going, I'm just three steps behind Brian. That my whole career is just, I don't know what he's writing next, but I'll be writing it soon. So uh, he's pastor of a, a church um, in St. Joseph, Missouri. Been there for 35 years. Can you imagine that? Plant a church and be there for 35 years. That doesn't happen. But his dedication to the church, uh, to the gospel, He's a Bible scholar, uh, he's, he's a pastor, he's an amazing speaker, writer. Let's welcome Brian Zahn. Thank you, Jim. A thousand years ago, Prince Vladimir, the pagan monarch of Kiev, was looking for a religion. You see, he wanted to unite the disparate tribes of Rus into a single people. And he knew that the best way to unite a people would be through a common religion. And so he began to investigate his options. And toward that end, he sent out delegations to find what's out there in terms of religion. And after they had gone forth and investigated the world of religion, they came back to give their report to Prince Vladimir. Some had found religions that were dour and austere. Others had found religions that were highly mystical. Some had found religions that forbid the consumption of alcohol, and that was ruled out immediately. That wasn't going to work in Russia. But the delegation that had investigated Christianity, they had gone to Constantinople. And they said, the Christians brought us to their place of worship. Of course, they're talking about Hagia Sophia. And when the Christians brought us into their house of worship, we no longer knew if we were on earth or in heaven. There was so much beauty. We have forgotten much that they said to us, but we can never forget such beauty. And Prince Vladimir said, I'll take the beautiful religion. And a thousand years ago, Christianity came to Russia. About 900 years later, Fyodor Dostoevsky was working on what would be one of his masterpieces, a novel called The Idiot. The Idiot is the story of Prince Mishkin, which Dostoevsky, well, it's his attempt to create a perfect character, in fact, a Christ character. Prince Mishkin has been at a mental institute in Switzerland and now has returned to St. Petersburg, Russia. Prince Mishkin has no interest in climbing the ladder in Russian society. He's not driven by money, sex, and power. And that's why he's called some 30 times in the novel an idiot. And yet people are attracted to him. Because he's not playing their games, he stands outside of that, people come to feel very comfortable with him and they find themselves opening to Prince Mishkin, the character of Christ in the novel, The Idiot. But in that novel, there's a line, it occurs twice, You don't actually hear Prince Mishkin say this. Rather, you hear people report that Prince Mishkin has said this. And the line is simply this. Beauty will save the world. It's in the novel twice. 
not actually in the mouth of Prince Michigan, but others talking about Prince Michigan said, did you hear that Prince Michigan said the other day that beauty will save the world? Now that line occurring twice in the novel is in no way necessary or central at all to the plot of the story. And yet from its publication, that little line, beauty will save the world, captured the imagination of thinkers around the world. Beauty will save the world. When Alexander Solzhenitsyn was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature and was giving his Nobel lecture, he made that the central theme of his lecture. And he said, when Dostoevsky wrote, beauty will save the world, it wasn't an enigma, it wasn't a riddle, it was a prophecy. Beauty will save the world. The Greek philosophers spoke of the true, the good, and the beautiful as the prime virtues. They are not utilitarian. They don't serve some other interest or end. They don't need to be justified by any other means. They justify themselves. In other words, we want the true because it's true. We want the good because it's good. We want the beautiful because it's beautiful. Later on, the early church fathers would identify the true and the good and the beautiful as attributes of God. They are indeed prime virtues because they are attributes of God. God is the supreme truth and goodness and beauty. Now the church has a long history in working with these three prime virtues. And so we have a long history of defending the truth as revealed in Christ. We call this Christian apologetics. And the success of these attempts vary. Uh, serious, serious apologetics uh, in a contemporary sense done by people like David Bentley Hart, I think are are uh, very welcomed. A lot of pop apologetics are not really designed to make the case for Christ to the outer world, the outside world, the non-believing world. They are just really there to kind of calm nervous Christians. So I'm not a big fan of pop apologetics. But in any case, we have a long history of engaging in the truth in the light of Christ. We call that Christian apologetics. Likewise, the church has a very long history in attempting to define what is truly good in the life of Christ, in the light of Christ. We would call this Christian aesthetics, Christian ethics rather, Christian ethics, the definition of the good in the light of Christ. And again, we have a long history of that. But when it comes to beauty, the church has been hit and miss. Christian aesthetics haven't quite reached that level. At times, the church has been a great patron of the arts. At times, the church has been capable of producing tremendous beauty. But in more contemporary times, I think the church has succumbed to the pressure to regard beauty as mere adornment. But that brings us to the time in which we live right now. Very, very late Modernity, crossing over into post-modernity somewhere. We're right there. And though I believe in the validity of Christian apologetics and Christian ethics, I don't know that that's going to win the day. In other words, if we are presenting ourselves to our wider world in an increasingly secular society, and we say to them, hey, we have absolute truth, and we know what's good for you, and we meet at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings. Care to join us? I believe we will mostly be ignored by droves of people. 
I am not contending that within the Christian faith we don't find absolute truth and we don't find a superior ethic. I, in fact, believe that. But I am speaking in terms of evangelism that if our presentation is based upon we have a superior morality, we have a superior ethic, that's going to be met with deep suspicion. And truthfully, for some very legitimate reasons. And yet that leaves this third prime virtue. What about Christian aesthetics? Rather than arguing for truth and goodness in the culture war context that seems to be so debilitating, what if we began to emphasize an enactment of beauty? What if we could embody beauty within our own communities? Cervantes says that it is the charm and prerogative of beauty to win hearts. Beauty can sneak past the defenses of the secularist. Those that are presently immune to arguments based in truth and ethics may in fact still be susceptible to the charm of beauty. The beauty of Christ is capable of winning those who are completely and deliberately rejecting other claims concerning Christ. Of course, coming to terms with what is beautiful is not always easy. Those that have attempted to write on this, I think, have found that it is difficult to come up with adequate definitions. Well, no matter how we define beauty, I think we can say this much. Beauty has something to do with form. Form. Whether it's a painting, a poem, a sculpture, a song, a dance, a drama. There's something about the form, when done right, achieves beauty. The arrangement of words in the poem, the arrangement of notes in the song, how the sculptor has arranged the marble, the dance, the plot line, the form of the novel, done well, done with artistry, it can achieve the beautiful. But I'm not here to speak as an art critic. I'm here to speak as a pastor, as a Christian. So what is the beautiful form for Christians that we should try to embody within the world if we're going to attract people to the beauty of Christ? Well, I think clearly it is the Christ form, the cruciform, Christ upon the cross, arms outstretched and proffered embrace, receiving the sin of the world violently sinned into him, praying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That is beautiful. That's the beauty to which we are in some way to conform. My wife and I took our first sabbatical. In 35 years of ministry, you know, we have a non-denominational charismatic church. We didn't know anything about sabbaticals. <laughs> then we heard about them and said, how do we get ourselves one of those? <laughs> so we took one last, last fall and I just feel like telling the story. Here's what happened. In 2012, I said to my wife, I cannot bear to be in America for another presidential election season. The madness is too much. And so we're going to have to make some arrangement to be elsewhere. And then we decided to take a sabbatical, and uh, Perry is the one that had the idea that we should walk the Camino de Santiago 
500 mile pilgrim walk from Saint Jean Pierre de Port, France, to Santiago de Compostela, Spain. We decided four years in advance that we were going to do that. So we had four years to prepare for it. Because I didn't want to be in the United States during another president. That was rather prescient of me, I believe. I mean, I knew it'd be crazy. I didn't know it'd be DEFCON 4 crazy, but. <laughs> so last September, October, I was, there was an ocean between the madness of America and Perry and I. Sometimes it takes an ocean not to break. The first day is a hard day. You cross the Pyrenees and it's 15 miles and then you drop down into Ronson Valles. Ronson Valles. And we check into the albergue and then we begin to explore the little town there. It's really all built around this monastery. And I walked into a thousand year old chapel and I saw the crucifix. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was giving me some direction. I felt like the Holy Spirit said, as you walk the Camino, enter every church you can. Find the crucifix. Pay attention to it. And ask this question, what does this mean? And don't be too quick to give an answer. And so that's what I did for 40 days and 40 nights. It was 500 miles of crucifixes. Now, over the course of doing this, you begin to note that most crucifixes achieve artistic beauty. I used to protest that. I used to say, yeah, but it wasn't that way. And that's true enough. Crucifixion was a means of psychological terror that Romans employed upon an occupied people to keep them in fear and keep them subservient. If we had a journalistic photograph from the Jerusalem Post of Good Friday, of the crucifixion there at Golgotha, you might look at it once, regret that you had, and never look at it again because it would be ghastly. It would be horrifying. It would be the epitome of all that is ugly and repulsive. And yet artists depict Christ crucified in terms of beauty. In my ignorance, I once protested that and said, well, that's not true to the form. That's not what it was. But I had made the mistake. Because you see, the role of the artist is to alert us to that which we are prone to overlook. Think about Van Gogh's Starry Night. Now, with Van Gogh's Starry Night, I think you know this painting, right? It's quite famous with, with the swirls, and there it is, yes. Now, if I ask you, in a very objective sort of way, is that a literal depiction of what a Starry Night looks like? No. But that isn't what Van Gogh is trying to do. Van Gogh is trying to say, hey, wake up. Every night they're there. A heaven filled with stars. You should slow down, pay attention, look up, and let that happen in your soul because a starry night really is filled with majestic beauty. And so Van Gogh, in his masterpiece, is saying to us, Pay attention to the beauty that's all around you. Because a starry night, in fact, really is like that. This is what the artists are doing with the crucifixion of Christ. Yes, there is a disguise, a veneer of that which is ugly and hideous. No doubt it's present. But Hans Urs von Balthasar... He teaches us this, being disguised under the disfigurement of an ugly crucifixion and death, Christ upon the cross is paradoxically the clearest revelation of who God is. And it's beautiful. So 
we see the beauty of this piece from Fra Angelico. And to that I say amen. Thank you, Brother Angelico, for reminding us that this is the greatest act of beauty in all of time and eternity. The moment when God absorbs into his own being the sins of the world and does not recycle it into vengeance and retaliation. But sin finds a place to die in the body of Christ and it is recycled into nothing but love and mercy. And Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That is the beauty that will save the world. And this is the beauty to which we need to conform I think at least for the foreseeable future, the time of persuading a post-Christian secular world by truth claims and claims of morality has been suspended. Now it's time to enact the beautiful. We have presented, in the midst of the culture war crisis of America, a Christianity that is the wagging finger of moralism. The furrowed brow of anger, the clenched fist of protest. And we need to find a way to adopt the cruciform. To be within the midst of an angry and broken and corrupt society enacting beauty saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Beauty will save the world. So we need to evaluate what we do as the church. Projects, sermons, how we posture ourselves within the community. Sure, we're going to ask, is it true? Sure, we're going to ask, is it good? But we must ask the third question. Is it beautiful? To be true and good is not enough. We have to ask the third question, is it beautiful? And we really don't get to answer that question. Our critics, those outside of the church, those that might merely happen to be looking on, they will answer the question whether or not it's beautiful. October 9th, 2004 was the day that Derrida died. The father of deconstruction philosophy died in Paris on that day, and I was in Paris on the day Derrida died. I had been preaching and speaking, and I was staying up north in Paris near Saint-Denis, And I'd heard that there was going to be a presentation at Notre Dame Cathedral. A multimedia presentation on the history of this grand edifice. And I decided I wanted to go to that. And so I got on the RER and I took the train into the city and I arrived a little bit early. And so I had some time on my hands. So I went across the river right there to the famous Shakespeare and Company bookstore very famous English-speaking bookstore where, you know, Hemingway and Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot and others used to hang out. Uh, It was just featured in the recent Woody Allen movie, uh, Midnight in Paris. And so I was there, and I was browsing, and I went over to where they they had the Russian masters, and I I was looking for something to read because I thought I need something to read going back because I hadn't brought anything with me, and it's like a 45-minute train ride back up to San Denis, so I'll get something to read, and I was browsing among the Russian masters, and there's Dostoevsky, and I said, that's what I want, and I bought a paperback edition of The Idiot. Now, this was, and I paid 12 euros for it, I remember, and this was an extravagant purchase because, you see, I already had a copy of The Idiot in my hotel room. A nice, hardback, 
every man library, nice silk ribbon edition. But I thought, well, I can knock out 45 minutes of it. 12 euros. It's extravagant, but it's central to my story. So after I made the purchase, the idiot and I went to Notre Dame Cathedral. We sat through the presentation. I was moved. Perhaps the idiot was too. I don't know. At the end of it, I found myself just bowing my head and praying very simply, God, use me more in this city. Amen. That was my prayer. And then the idiot and I, we left the cathedral and we went to the train station, got on the train, sat down, and I began to read. I'm not an outgoing person. Don't let this fool you. I'm actually an introvert. This is okay because I'm kind of in control here. But uh, I'm not the guy that talks to people on planes and trains. That's what my wife does. I sit down. We went a stop or two. People are coming and going. I'm paying no attention. I'm immersed in the idiot. At some point, a young man got on the train and sat opposite me. He was an Asian young man. Never did find out what country. Maybe Korea, but I'm not sure. His name was Yu, which makes telling the story kind of confusing. <laughs> you got on the train with me in Paris on the day that Derrida died. <laughs> and I was paying no attention to you, but you said to me, oh, that's an interesting book you're reading there. And I looked up and I said, oh. So, yeah, the idiot, Dostoevsky, have you read this? He said, I'm reading it right now. I said, well, that's a bit of a coincidence. And we began to talk. And I said, uh, so what are you doing in Paris? He said, well, I just graduated from college and I'm backpacking, you know, throughout Europe. I said, oh, that's awesome. I said, what was your degree in? He said, oh, I got two degrees. I said, man, a go-getter. Two degrees. What were your degrees in? He said, well, I got a degree in political science and a degree in world history. I said, that's a great combination of degrees because political science is the study of man's attempt to govern himself and world history is the record of our failures to do so. <laughs> and he laughed and said, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> and so we began to converse. We talked about the fact that Derrida had died. We had common interest in philosophy. We talked about literature. We talked about various things. And then I said to you, so you're a young man just out of college and, and uh, you've got these degrees in political science and world history. What's your hope for the world? He said, oh, I have no hope. I said, no hope? You have no hope? Oh, that's a bit sad. Kind of continued to talk a little bit. And then he said to me, I heard, and this is exactly, this is the exact language. He said, I heard that Dostoevsky was a born-again Christian. Do you know anything about that? I said, well, I might. And so I began to tell him the story of Dostoevsky, you know, born 1821, and he kind of grew up in a religious family, but then walked away from that and was some form of an agnostic, tending toward nihilism, and he was a part of a subversive writer's group that got afoul of the czar, and they were arrested and put in the St. Peter and Paul prison, and then were sentenced to execution, and they were brought forth, and and they were lined up, and the various, you know, commands were being read out, and at the last moment... A horseman came galloping, galloping into the parade ground saying, Halt, halt, halt. The czar has commuted your sentence. You will spend four years in hard labor and four years in exile in Siberia. And Dostoevsky would refer to that many times throughout his life. And he would say, it was at that moment that my life was given back to me. I was convinced that my life was over at age 27, and now it's back. He was immediately clamped in irons and manacles and put in a sled and taken in the winter or off to Siberia. He got frostbite. He wore the scars of those manacles for the rest of his life. And as he was going into this Russian gulag that he writes about in his book, House of the Dead, he was given a single book. Remember, I'm telling this to you on the train in Paris on the day that Derrida died. 
And that book was a copy of the New Testament. And this extremely literary man, the only thing he had to read for four years was the New Testament. And it revived his faith. And in fact, you, the idiot in this story is his attempt to create a beautiful character that reflects the nature of Christ. I'm telling this to you on the train in Paris on the day that Derrida died. And then you said to me, well, what do you do? I said, I said, well, you, I'm a pastor. He said, no way. <laughs> Which made me feel good. Because, listen, though I love being a pastor, I don't want to be the guy that people just see walking on the street. Oh, I bet that's a pastor. <laughs> Looks like one to me. I don't want to be that. And then he became serious and he said, well, since you're a pastor, I'll tell you this. Uh, I grew up in a Christian home, but in high school I became an atheist. And I've been an atheist all through high school and all through college. I believe there's no God. But yesterday I went to Notre Dame Cathedral just to see the architecture, you know. I said, yeah, I know. He said, but when I walked in, I was overwhelmed by the beauty, and I knew there was a God. I knew I had been wrong, and I tried to pray. I said, God, I'm sorry that I walked away from you, but I don't think you heard my prayer. <laughs> I said, you? He heard your prayer. Because let me tell you, I just came from that cathedral, and I prayed there too. I prayed God use me more in this city. You see, God is economical about answering prayer. <laughs> and God said, well, I can, I can kill two birds with one stone. And so he had me buy this book. I already have one of these. You, it's in, the, it's in my room. But I had to buy it. And you had to get on the train, sit opposite me, a remark that I'm reading the idiot, and we'd have this conversation. It would all come to this moment. I said, you can have the same hope that Dostoevsky found. This hope that Jesus brings to the world. He is the beauty that will save the world. I said, you, would, would you like to pray? He said, I would like that. And so we, we bowed our heads and we prayed and, and I prayed for you. And, and on the train in Paris on the day that Derrida died. And then I said, amen. And I thought I'd been on the train maybe 20 minutes, but when I looked up, I was at my stop. I said, oh, you, I have to go. And I just jumped off the the train, and off it went. And I stood there on the platform, and I thought, I feel like an angel. Whew, I feel like an, like an angel. People ask me, did you get his email? Angels don't ask for email. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know where you is today, but I kind of like to think that He's out there somewhere. And now and then he says, you know, it was the day that Derrida died. And the idiot was on the train with me. <laughs> but I think he was an angel. <laughs> you... was saved by beauty. Arguments from truth and goodness no longer prevailed in this very intelligent young man. You was not saved by arguments for truth and ethics. 
You was saved by beauty. And beauty will save the world. Thank you.